My name is Magnus Langren, as I said. I'm a photographer and writer. I'm very passionate about underwater photography. Uh, and uh, uh, I do a lot of nature conservation uh, communication. And uh, I also like adventures in nature. So this is what my work is about, basically. Uh, I've been doing it for a long time, and uh, I don't plan to change that at all. Uh, just to give you an idea, I, 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 I do a lot of underwater photography, and this is a shot from uh, the Bahamas, uh, where I'm photographing a great hammerhead. It is not me in the picture, it's actually my dive buddy, uh, Tammy, from uh, uh, Australia. Uh, but it's the way it looks like when I'm out photographing that type of equipment that I'm using. In. Okay. Uh, I'm also involved in uh, uh, some projects, uh, working with multi-year projects uh, uh, like the Wild Wonders of Europe and Wild Wonders of China. We do books. And, uh, and a lot of other stuff, uh, like uh, exhibitions, uh, uh, um, communication around uh, wildlife and nature conservation in many different forms. So that's a little bit about my background. Uh, the start of this, uh, this whole uh, uh, thing uh, that uh, I'm involved in now is actually... Kristoff Grohl, uh, the rowing man, who is going to uh, row from uh, Warsaw to Paris. He's starting 1st of May until the 18th of June. So he is actually the guy who started in this uh, L'Europe à la Ram uh, project. And uh, I've, I know him since before, and we have done some things in Papua New Guinea. Uh, so uh, this is uh, he's going to go in that type of boat all the way to Paris. Uh, yeah, here you can see the map uh, just to give you an idea of what he's doing. Uh, and uh, he's going from, uh, you can see, starting the 1st of May all the way on the right hand side. And he's going through different countries like Germany, Netherlands, and then down to Belgium to Paris. And he found a way where he can actually row whole, the whole way with this boat. And as you can see, the different colors. That's uh, where he's going to go with the current. The red parts is the tough part for him. That's against the current. And the green parts, he thinks, is going to be no current at all. And this is all his theories. We will see how it goes. Uh, it's going to be very exciting. Uh, okay. Along that path, when he's going from, uh, from Warsaw to, uh, to Paris, He's passing through a lot of uh, different natural areas and rivers. He's also going to be uh, rowing in canals, which is not as much nature as in the in the real rivers. Uh, but uh, there is there is a biodiversity story and a, a story about rewilding that he's passing through all the way down to Paris. Uh, so me and my colleague Stefan, we did two photo missions each to uh, photograph what is around th those areas where he's going to pass. Uh, the interesting part is that the rivers, the concept of the rivers is that they're, they're actually flowing through different countries. And uh, it's something that we co-own, uh, that we have to share responsibility. And what is happening further up uh, the river is going to affect maybe another country or a different place further down. And this is a concept that humankind has been uh, have difficult to to cope with when somebody is uh, when something is co-owned. Uh, so this is an interesting uh, aspect of the whole project, I think. Okay, uh, nature photography. So I went out to two different areas to do some nature photography and try to uh, to see what I can find in biodiversity wise and rewilding. And here I just uh, took a picture for that I took from another mission when I was in Danube Delta, uh, just to show you that photography has a lot to do with skills and opportunity, but people don't understand that it's it's uh, a lot, even as much 
is uh, is uh, affect the work the, the outcome is affected by your research before uh, you have to do do a lot of uh, uh, you have to find the right spot and the right time and also when you're out there a, a factor that is not only skills and opportunity in research is that you have to put in a lot of hard work to do nature photography and basically we fail and we succeed and we find a way when we're there so it is a it's difficult to plan exactly how it's going to be like uh, but the more you you do assignment photography uh, the better you get on adapting to the situations so this one is a shot of a frog that i'm using a, 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 a both under underwater and above water to take the shot and it's of course it's a difficult shot to take and if i'm not really prepared it's impossible to take it so this is about nature photography and basically these two missions i was going on is i knew that i was going also to do some work underwater and uh, because uh, i'm an underwater photographer as well as topside and uh, that's why when I choose the places, I was trying to find out if there was uh, these possibilities. Uh, it's very difficult uh, because people don't know much about this. Uh, so uh, it's always a little bit of I have to guess what they're saying uh, and adapt it to my brain. The, the, the fun thing about underwater is that uh, the wildlife let me come close in, in when I'm in the water uh, more easy than it's topside, basically. The problem is that it's more difficult. It's you have a limited time where you basically you do a dive. Uh, maybe you have 60 or 90 minutes to, to work. And also that the visibility, how far you can see in the water can vary a lot. I will tell you more about that later. Okay, so uh, with all this information, I uh, I had to choose two places where I, I wanted to shoot, where I think I had a good chance to, to do something that can be used for this project. And the first place I, 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 uh, I decided to go to uh, was in Hafel, uh, Lower Hafel. It's a restored river system where Christophe is passing. So if you follow the blue line from, you see the Ordo Canal, uh, it's, it's on the mid middle of the map, lower a little bit, lower down, and you follow, you come to Spree, and then you see the, 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 the white ring with the number one in. That's where uh, Christophe is passing. And that is where Lower Hafel is. And uh, that's the first spot I went to. Uh, the second spot I went to was Ordo Delta, which is number three, which is quite far from where actually Christophe uh, uh, is passing. He's coming much further down. You see the line where it's, he's coming from Varta into the yellow line, which is the border, and then he's going down to Odra, which is the river Odor, uh, further south. But if you follow Odor, Odor River all the way up, you come to the 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 uh, uh, odor delta and the delta is where the the river odor meets uh, the baltic sea and it's like a big lagoon and there's a lot of rivers there and it's basically the same uh, uh wildlife that you can find further down but it's much better chance for me to photograph it up there so i decided to to go to number three to take images that is connected to the odor delta or the odor river where uh, uh christophe is passing and then you see number two, that is the where the uh, the Hafel River starts, and that's the place I needed to go to because the visibility and there were some problems in number one and three, so I couldn't shoot underwater. So I was shooting in number one and three, and I was shooting underwater mainly in round number two. Okay. So that is the, the background. So what did I find? I will tell you a little bit about what I found and what I found interesting in the river system and if I found any rewilding going on and so on. So here we are, this is a lower half of the river. It's, it's a place surrounded by, uh, by farmland. As you can see, there's a lot of uh, uh, farming going on there. It is the largest, most important non-coastal wetland in Central Europe. Uh, you can see that the Hafel River is the main river that you can see followed down in the picture. 
uh, it is like a highway for nature, you know, like fish, uh, loose, loose plants, drifting, sediment, many organisms, but also for humans. You can see some boats on the left side. They're also using it as a highway. So this is a, basically you can call it a highway, a watery highway. And it, it runs down all the way and joins Elbe River. And then the Elbe River continues out all the way to the North Sea. So it's, this is not going out in the Baltic Sea. It's going on the other side to the North Sea. Of course, there's a mosaic, uh, uh, how do you say? It? It's a mosaic uh, waters, what I call mosaic waters, which is tr a lot of tributaries, small rivers, small uh, creeks, lakes, ponds. It's connected to this river. And this is what they try to rewild in one way. I, I mean, I will talk more about that later on. Here you can see one of the tributaries. This is, this is shot from the top uh, uh, from an airplane, as well as the other picture was. And you can see that there's a lot of uh, farmland, but also a lot of people living close to Hafel River. And it's a very attractive place. Uh, uh, both all the waters around uh, in Germany and people who, who like to be outdoors, like to be close to water. So you can see uh, that the, this tributary, there's, it's a small creek that is running into Havel. Uh, there is a sm small uh, boat that this people is using for recreational, going out fishing, spending time on the river and so on. And this is one of the great values of, the, of, the, of river systems, is that recreational level of uh, people being out there, enjoying nature and reconnecting with nature. Also, what I found around Havel was a lot of uh, you know, fields with wild grass and, and, and uh, flowers and, uh, yeah, not farmland, wild meadows. And this is a, this is a shikori. This is a blue flower that was used in the old days, uh, old days for some sort of uh, cooking uh, and eating. But the biodiversity of the wild meadows around river systems is very important. And they are uh, contributing to what we call the, uh, the biodiversity, the, the variety of life around rivers. And the variety of life is the nature's stability, stability pact. That is how it's, the system becomes stable. So it's something that we, we should treasure and something that we should uh, take care of. Also in the river, uh, here is there, there's a lot of biodiversity in different animals and plants. And uh, some of the most amazing animals and life cycles is the dragonflies. Uh, this is a, a pair of dragonflies, a male and a female. The male is on the top and they are mating or they have been mating. And uh, it's actually the, the male of the dragonfly on the top is, has some sort of... Uh, uh, claws at the end of his body and he he holds the back of the head of the female and she can and th that's what they do when they mate but when they have been mating they are flying together and she's putting eggs down in the river so this is what's happening in the picture uh, it's very difficult to take this one because they are so fast uh, uh, what's happened is that the egg goes in the river there is a, a when the egg hatch there is a, a, a dragonfly larva living in the river for quite a long time depending on if it's cold or not cold and which species but sometimes several years uh, and then uh, when it's when the, the larva thinks it's time to become a, a dragonfly they hatch and they be, they go up to the terrestrial life and starts flying around hunting along the the river banks so they live both underwater and uh, uh, in the air during their lifetime. Very fascinating creatures. In Haufel, I also uh, there is some there's a lot of lakes connected, and uh, uh, this is from the Gulper Sea or Lake Gulper, uh, which is close by to the Haufel River where I where I stayed, and. Uh, it's a very shallow lake, 
and it's fed by the Haffel River. So the, the Haffel River is, of course, very important for the lake, and uh, water flows in there, and there's a lot of uh, uh, plants, and it's not, not many meters deep, and all the different birds, they love to stay there, uh, and it's a safe haven for them when they stay in the water. Uh, and there was like, I found in one corner of that lake, there was like thousands of these gray lag geese uh, resting. And it's, a, it's a, so many, many geese. It was uh, nice to see how these lakes could support so much wildlife and so much biomass. Uh, these geese, they, are, they, are, they like to be in the, in the lake for safety but they go up on the and eat grass just like a horse they eat uh, grass all day uh, and uh, uh, because uh, there's not so much nutrients in the grass they need to eat a, lo a long time just that, so it looks like they are grazing like horses they mate for life this this uh, this uh, uh, this geese but and then and I found an interesting point that actually if, it was it was i read 14 to 20 percent of the gray lag uh, pairs that mate for life are actually homosexual pairs which is people don't think that homosexuality uh, exists in nature but it does quite a lot actually uh, i don't know why i'm saying that but i just found that that's an interesting po point uh, when i was reading about this different subject i had okay now uh, uh, here you can see the Haffel River, and you can see how man uh, have is trying to straighten the the river by uh, by making it. Uh, 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 I don't know how to explain this, but the 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 bend that it goes going into the left and around the corner there, and then back into the the, the main uh, Haffel River. That's the natural bend. The straight one is man made. And uh, he's been there for ease of navigation for for uh, humans. Uh, the the rewilding that is occurring in this area is that they're opening up old bends and they're trying to keep more water in the area. Uh, when it was this, the Haffel River area was degrading before. Uh, they had shut down a lot of the water systems and uh, the water passed very fast and it was making nature weaker and uh, the biodiversity went low uh, and now they're trying to uh, to open up and let the the water different waters uh, exist again uh, okay continue in the small ponds around the Haffel, I, I found frog life. This is was in the autumn. I was there in September. So uh, the, fr the most active uh, when it comes to mating and so on with frogs is in the spring. But this is an edible frog that we found. They are in the water quite a long time uh, all during the summer and also in the autumn a little bit. They are born as a vegetarian. When they're very small and they, they hatch, uh, their eggs hatch in the water and they swim around like a tadpole and they are vegetarian. But they reach a certain size, they become carnivorous. They start to eat insects and stuff like that, and they become a frog. When there's not so much food around, this frog is a cannibal, so it can eat their own species. And also in Sweden, at least, when they, when they come into small ponds where there's other frogs, they eat the other frogs. So this is one is, uh, <laughs> this is one is, a uh, is a tough guy. Uh, it's one of the, it's one of the green frogs and, uh, uh, it's a high, actually a hybrid, uh, thought to be a hybrid between a marsh frog and a pool frog. Uh, Okay, the frogs, uh, they, they need uh, small waters to reproduce. It's important for them. And this is what happened when you start ditching uh, an area. Uh, you're, putting, you're making small canals to make them dry so you can create farmland. Then we lose waters like this one that you're looking at because the land dries out and uh, because people want to farm. Uh, and why frogs like this, this, this shallow fish ponds that dry out in the end of the summer is because there's no fish. What I like these ponds, I mean, these uh, fish free ponds, it's because they dry out so that no fish can live there in the, and then in the, in spring, they fill up again. And when the frogs go in there to put their eggs, they have a much higher, uh, uh, 
likelihood to survive when there's not fish eating them. So they like this, this, these small ponds and it's very good for, uh, for the frog life. Uh, I was in the area in in, uh, in Hafel in the autumn, and uh, so there was not any birds breeding. But you can see here that, that the mute swan, uh, there is the uh, their their chicks are much bigger, and then uh, this is they were born in the spring. I realized very early when I looked at the area that these reed beds that you see in the back, the high tall grass, was very important, very productive, and. Uh, uh, I went down to have a look at those. This is underwater, where you can see a young pike uh, lurking in the reed bed. This is the reed bed that is sticking up. And this is a, an area very popular uh, in, in the lakes and in the river. Uh, a lot of fish hang out there and uh, uh, so on. And one evening, uh, Quite early, when I was in Hafal, I went out to check out. The, you can see the reeds at, at, the, uh, at the bottom. And I also saw the cranes were coming because the cranes were moving south. So they, uh, this, uh, that's, a, that's a flock of sea, uh, cranes flying there. And they like to stay in the water in the night. So they always stay somewhere where they can stand in the water because that's protecting them from predators. So I was out there shooting some nice shots. And then I, I see something coming swimming, and, and it looks like a little fur ball coming swimming in the water. And this was not no research; it was just happening, and I, I was not expecting to see beavers there. And I looked at it, and it didn't look like a beaver because the tail was round; it was not a flat. And I realized it was a, the nutria. It's a, it's it felt like it came swimming from South America because it's an invasive species that's been imported to Europe, but now it's so well established that we will never get rid of it again here. So it's it's a, it's one of the species that is is quite common in in Europe. It was introduced by hunters for for hunting because of the nice fur. So here I find the the nutria. It's a it's a rodent, vegetarian eating. Uh, a lot of the reeds, uh, uh, it, it's eating a lot, and it's creating. Uh, sometimes it, they they have they they clear uh, whole grounds from food because they eat so much. They eat twenty five percent of their body weight daily. It says uh, so. Here they live in very small in small families. Here's two young ones. Uh, uh, of course, the, the closest one is eating something, holding something in its, in its hand. Uh, they're very cute and uh, very adorable. To I, I was studying them for, for many, many days. Uh, and I, I think they're so nice as subjects. And it's also a little bit controversial about their existence and so on. But I think that whatever human beings are doing is also part of evolution. So this is something that... Now we have to, we, we cannot repair this. Here's a close up of a nutria when it's on the ground. They like to eat grass as well, just like, uh, uh, like the geese was doing. But they have four teeth that's called incisors that grow their whole life. Uh, that's the two one in the front. That's what the rodents have. But inside it has 20 other teeth. Why the teeth are this uh, orange is because. Uh, it's a pigment staining from iron, so they become this red. Uh, I think it's from what uh, the environment they live in. Uh, they are also they also have become some sort of uh, global temperature uh, indicator because they, it's believed that as global temperature rise, they will spread north and they will probably end up in Sweden where I live as well. Also in, in Hafel, I found this uh, invasive species. It's quite interesting. It's the, this is the, what we call the, the Chinese mitten crab. Mitten means gloves. Uh, and uh, it was probably spread very early in the, uh, around 1900 by uh, boats coming from Southeast Asia and uh, in their ballast tanks. And when they empty them, there is... Uh, uh, larva of different animals, and then they are introduced into different environments. Uh, there's a lot of complaints in uh, in Germany ab about this crab because it's it's 
it's destroying fish nets and digging holes and doing a lot of stuff. Here, next picture, you can see why it's called the wool. Uh, uh, it's called the, the Chinese mitten crab. But we call it in Swedish wool hand crab because it has this this uh, uh, this uh, fur on on the on the floor. This is a picture very close, also in the uh, Havel area, uh, where you can see that the, uh, the, the I don't know exactly what this dam is about, but there is a dam, and uh, it's it's a way to stop the water, uh, maybe to keep the water there. It doesn't look like a hydro plant uh, or a power plant, but you can clearly see that there's something nice. It's that on the side of the of the dam structure there is a fish path built. And this is something that we should build in every river where there is a blockage. Uh, and it, this is built like a ladder style. So there you can see there is like small, uh, small stone ridges that the fish have to jump up. But this is enabling the fish to migrate up and down. And also uh, other animals, of course. And the fish migrate in the rivers a lot, much more than we think. And not only to go up and reproduce where they were born, uh, but they do that. Uh, but they also do go to different areas for better uh, uh, feeding conditions or if it's uh, other conditions with water quality and so on, and they want to move up and down the system. Uh, it's a huge problem when uh, uh, we have dams or block blocking the fish paths and there's no extra fish path built. Here's just some example. This is shot this I was took in Norway, but just the, for the salmon, it's a huge problem with the with the dams, of course. Uh, also for another, I was shooting this one. These, these two shots are not from this mission. It's this one is I shot in an aquarium actually. This is the sturgeon, but the two, two species that has a lot of problems uh, uh, when it comes to uh, dams and and blocking the the rivers. Is sturgeon and salmon, but there's so many more. Uh, but these are one of the most known ones. This is the last shot from Havel, uh, where you can see this is called the, the, uh, an algae bloom. Uh, this is the, the, the rivers are, there is an algae bloom seasonally in rivers, but this is called eutrophication, it meaning that there is too much nutrients in the river. Uh, it could be caused by uh, uh, fertilizers used by farmers. It could be industrial waste. It could be sewage, shit coming out uh, in the in the in the water system. But it usually, for fresh water, it becomes phosphorus. Uh, uh, it's it's too much phosphorus, and it's becoming too nutrient. And then there is an algae bloom. And this, this is very dangerous for the river system and also for the for the inhabitants of the river system. So this is the last shot from Havel, and I couldn't take much many pictures because the water looked like this. Uh, so when I stuck my camera down, I could only see maybe I could not only see maybe one two centimeters from the. It was so murky. So I went to another area to do underwater photography. Okay, so. Here, uh, where I went, it was uh, uh, where actually the Havel River starts. It was that number uh, number two on the map, and there is a it's like a lake district that is quite famous, and there is some clear lakes there. And so I think I can shoot uh, some of the species that is actually existing in Havel and in the older river where Christopher is passing in the clear water. At least you can see what what's down there. So here I'm in a lake. This lake, this lake is so clean that I can I can take out my regulator when I'm diving. I can drink water uh, while diving. It's fantastic. It's very beautiful. And, and where you see that house up there, that's where people sit. Uh, that's a that's a cafe where people sit and have a cup of coffee. And then the, the sun is bouncing on the window, so that's why you get this light effect. And you can see a small perch just in the light there, and that's. Because it's so clear, there is also a lot of uh, uh, plants that can live and do photosynthesis. Uh, so these these plants they create like 
like fields and meadows of aquatic plants. And when you're diving there, it's really fantastic to see and beautiful. And you can see all the different type of fish living in uh, among these. Uh, so, and it's the meadows and the and the, the lake and the, and the river life is also seasonal. So when the water becomes uh, uh, cold and we get less sun, uh, then of course a lot of uh, plants die down and then they, they come back in the spring. Here you can see a detail of, uh, of, a, of a plant underwater and that's where the photosynthesis is happening also underwater. It's very nice. There is also the water lilies that I was photographing. Water lily is a, is a plant that can basically grow anywhere. They're very, they, they can grow in very uh, different environments. And they grow from the bottom all the way up to the surface where they have this canopy of leaves and also these big, beautiful flowers. So here I'm at the bottom shooting up. You can see uh, the sun behind the leaves. This is the, the yellow water lily that is, uh, is it's, been, it's been used in cooking a lot and it, uh, it's quite big. And uh, I'm shooting it very close to the surface. So it's creating a mirror effect of the stems. And uh, it's nice to see how the, the water lilies, they create like reeds or, or I mean, uh, uh, banks on forests of their own and you can dive in under there and you have like a, it's like being in a forest here along the reeds uh, uh, you can find the reed beds you can find this fish quite a lot and it's very famous fish in i think in all europe it is very well spread in the world it's called the european european perch or just perch uh, it's very popular among anglers, uh, and they live in usually they live in schools uh, or uh, groups, or and uh, we call them schools in, uh, in underwater, not flocks. And uh, when they are a certain size, around ten centimeters or one decimeter, they become carnivorous. They start to eat other fish. And sometimes, when when this, when the, when the lake or something is not in balance they all uh, become a whole uh, generation becomes 10 centimeters at the same time but then there is not so uh, so so much fish to, for them to eat and there's not many predators so then they all st stop growing and uh, it's called in in swedish if i translate swedish it's called thousand brothers and then you come into a lake, there's all the perches are the same size in huge schools. And they, they, they will not grow bigger because uh, the ecosystem don't allow them to do that. So that is when you can see that the lake is not really in balance. Here is just, uh, I think it's, a, it's the way I like to shoot. It's just shoot, you know, showing how you can show movement in a, in a still image. Uh, and there's a certain technique when you use a long shutter speed and some strobe light in the same image. Uh, to take pictures like this, you need a lot of time with the subject, meaning that I need, a, I need a, as a nature photographer, we need time in nature. We need the time to spend there because we fail a lot and we just have to go back and redo. Here was another fish showing up that, that was quite cool. Uh, it's called tench, and sometimes it's also called the doctor fish. And uh, and they are quite big, and uh, they, they can this this fish the tench can live in 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 clear lakes, but it can also live in very very turbid waters. But it's it's very slippery, like an eel f covered in slime. And the f the the, f the people believe in folklore. They thought that if a, a fish in the in the in the river or in the river or in the lake is sick, they can go up and rub against this fish, and they will become uh, cured. And that's why they called it the doctor's fish. Another very important player in uh, in the river system and in lakes is the crayfish. Uh, this is the noble crayfish that is. Uh, 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 native to to northern europe uh, and 
they live on the bottom they dig holes they 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 make a lot they they uh, they interact a lot with their ecosystem around them and uh, if you even if they look kind of complicated with all these legs and the claws and everything they can go so fast but backwards so you can see that at the end of the tail there is like a small spade and when they start moving that one they can go backwards through any vegetation because everything is just streamlined but for backwards so they can go they can they can flee from a from a predator very very quickly uh there's a lot of fish that likes to eat them also mammals like mink and otters but what they do is that they they are true scavenger, scavengers working on this on the on the, uh, the the bed of the lake and the river eating plants insects fish eggs snails and so on so they are basically the cleaner uh, person or the cleaner animal in the lake or in the river very nice animals what i also found in the, in the clear lakes uh, was pikes the northern pike it's i call it the freshwater barracuda if, if people know what a barracuda is it's a big fish uh, uh sometimes they're very small you can fall like 10 centimeters but of course but they can grow to a very big size and in this particular place where i was diving in this this area where i'm here there was a lot of uh, trees that has been falling down on the riverside and these trees formed like uh, you know the terrestrial forest invaded into the water so this is the fallen trees and normally a small pike would never stand like this this is only the big pike that dare to stand totally open just waiting around for something to happen or seeing an opportunity to eat because they are cannibalistic so meaning that a small pike would be very vulnerable to be eaten by another pike so the big pikes they can do this but the small pikes they can't okay so the, this is the a, a portrait taken from the top so the, the pike face uh, i'm just hovering above the pike to take this shot and uh, you can see that i'm just so you know that a pike can grow to one and a half meter long and it can weigh almost 30 kilos that is recorded record specimen but, but still it's a huge fish and quite impressive to meet and, uh, and it has its certain ways Here's one big pike that was standing in in the uh, in the reed bed where all the all the reeds are standing and I approached it very very slowly I thought but for some reason I don't know what why it just darted out and just passed my my head very 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 close and I was I was lucky enough to push the button and take the shot but normally they just stand still and the, the only time they go for for a quick burst is when they're going to catch a prey so maybe there was something behind me i don't know but this one moved for sure in a in an aggressive ma manner but it's not was not going for me but it was coming very close uh so uh, you can see uh, you can see the uh, under the the face of the of the pike there you can see some uh, some round dots where you have the sensors so you could feel uh, what is what is uh, you know uh, what what is around it if you if i move like a pike the pike stands still and they move very 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 patiently and slowly if they want to move to a certain area to catch a perch or uh, some other fish so i did the approach to approach this big pike very very slowly and see if it could you know uh, tolerate me being very this close with the camera and it did so it uh, meaning that just letting the animals adapt is also a way how to 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 get close to to animals and you have to be very much in control of yourself your own body when you're doing stuff like this but this one i i'm just like literally 15 centimeters from the nose there so i pretend to be pike and i could get close to a pike that was basically the story of this shot and some of my photographer friends uh, asked me when i came came back uh, to to sweden after being over there in germany did you get close to the pikes and i said yeah i showed them this image 
this is a, like a, a detail of the pike's face this is how close i got if i if i'm close to a northern pike long enough and it wants to stand its ground this is what a lot of fish do underwater they after a while they want to show uh, dominance or show their power they yawn so they open the full mouth for quite a long time and stretch their jaws to show what they got and it happens a lot of time and it was happening of course here uh, when i was uh, lying there waiting to photograph it and then suddenly it opens its mouth to show me that okay uh, it's telling me to just not come closer basically <laughs> and it's, it happens a lot when I do that with frog fishes, if I do it with uh, uh, cods, do it uh, uh, a lot, a lot of different uh, fish groupers, a lot of different fish do that one. Okay, so that was where some impressions from the clear water world uh, where I could shoot underwater, and that was like a plan. It was, I, I didn't plan to go there from the start, but that was the conditions. Then I went to Oder Delta. Uh, uh, that is where the Oder River is finding the Baltic Sea. And it's a very dynamic area and uh, uh, super interesting. But just before me going there, there was an ecolo ecological disaster happening in Oder, uh, where 100, around 100 ton of fish died quite uh, uh, suddenly. And uh, it was in the news and everything, and I was like, "What? What, what am I supposed to do?" I, I was planning to go to Oder Delta, and I got this all these problems. So I, I was talking to the people at Rewilding Europe that is active in the area, but where it happened, it was actually in the Oder River, quite far south, uh, much further south than actually where where uh, where the Delta is, and also further south where compared to where Christophe will be passing. But a lot of fish died there, and it's of course connected to uh, to the delta where I was going. And uh, they don't know exactly what the problem was. I couldn't see any dead fish, anything where I was, and uh, there was no indication. And they told me that before I was going. But uh, the theories why that happened it was that uh, it was a very hot summer, very low water, reduced oxygen level in the river and an algae bloom that is all things that can happen and then that, that that was combined with some sort of uh dumping of salt and polluted other pollution on the polish side and that combined created a perfect storm uh, uh making a, an uh, creating an ecological uh, disaster for uh, uh higher up in the older river and this is the theory uh this is not uh because i i, I just checked yesterday there's still not it's still in the blur and then people don't want really to to address it it seems like so i, I cannot say anything more, more uh, about that right now anyway so i went i went anyway to the older delta uh and uh uh, uh I, I, I found, you know, these fairy tale rivers in the middle of them. You can see a small, small river in in a real true forest uh, place. This is uh, two rivers I was I, I was uh, investigating: the Govenica and Ina rivers. And this is small tributaries running in very clear that is running into the to the Oder Delta. Very beautiful. And this guy is uh, his, his name is Arton Fordina. He's working with the rewilding of these rivers. And he's uh, supporting the, some river stretches there with some fundamental basic features. And then he's just letting nature take care of itself. It's called rewilding. And it's a very efficient way uh, of uh, uh, letting uh, nature heal itself. Here is a, this is a aerial shot. If you look straight down, uh, you can see in the middle, there's a, it's a, that's the river. You can see three people. Uh, uh, on the upper side, that's me standing here and driving the drone. But this is where they just put in a lot of spawning gravel. This was like two days before. So you, where I, where we are standing, just north or above the river river bank there down there, you can see there's a lot of uh, uh, 
tracks from cars. So they just, just drove in a lot of uh, spawning gravel to, to give this uh, river a, uh, a favorable spawning ground for, for the sea trouts coming up. And you see they damage a lot of the area around the, the river, but that will heal itself in one year. But now the, the gravel ground is, is going to be very, very efficient. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, time. Close to the rivers, okay, I found this is a green huntsman spider. I also went in the, in the, in the area to a place called Anklamer Stadtbuch. This is a place that was, has been re-wetted. It's called re-wetting. That is when you're making a place wet again. And it's been dried out because they used the peat. Peat is like uh, to, I think it, what they used it for uh, uh, burning. But here there was a big storm and uh, the, the walls for the, the, keeping the peat, this, this place dry, uh, broke down. And then they, they decided to, to let it be wet and, and they helping it to, to re-wet. And it became such a dramatic uh, wildlife comeback around that area. So now it's, uh, it's just full of uh, fishing herons. Here you can see the gray heron in the front that just caught a fish and it's eating it. And then mm, the white, the great, uh, the great white egret is coming instantly, uh, trying to, because they like to steal, uh, food from each other. And, uh, the gray heron has to, to swallow it quickly. But this, this wet, re-wetted areas, the areas that is becoming wet again, it's creating wetlands and it's supporting so much wildlife and so ma uh, a lot of uh, high density of bird, birds. This is the dunlins and they were just swarming around there. They were probably on the way south uh, for the winter. So the older delta and the river uh, is, of course, serving as a bus stop on the way for the birds to go up north or when they go down south but there's of course also a lot of wildlife that is stationary living there year round so uh, and also the the delta in itself is like a success story for this the white-tailed eagle here you can see two eagles sitting in the in the tree and uh there's the highest nowadays. There's the, the highest density of white-tailed eagles in Central Europe is around here, and it was down to 23 nesting pairs, uh, like 100 years ago, and now there are three to 400. Why have they come back? Yeah, well, it's because there's no hunting anymore. Uh, you stop the pesticides like DDT and stuff like that, but mainly because there is new habitats, the rewilded habitats where they can, they can live and they can hunt and they can uh, reproduce. So this is the largest eagle in Europe. It's more than two, meet, two meters wingspan. It's a very impressive animal. They, the the, the white-tailed eagle, they like water. They, they would live quite often around the sea, but also in rivers, lakes, wetlands. Uh, so this is a, is a, a huge predator connected to wet the, the wetlands. Here you can see when it's taking off from that log, uh, sitting close to that uh, that reed, uh, and waiting to see if there's any fish close to the surface that he can catch. This is a guy I met. He's on the Polish side of the delta. He's like a local naturalist guy. Uh, and he's bringing out people to see wildlife uh, in his boat. Uh, and his name is Peter. And uh, I went out with him to to see if we could get close to the to the eagles while they were hunting. And uh, just like the the fishermen in the delta do, uh, uh, there is uh, bycatch that is thrown overboard, and uh, the eagles they. They, they go down and take it. So he brought some fish out and he threw fish in the, in the, in the water and uh, instantly the, the sea eagle came down and took the fish. 
Okay, so that was images from the Havel uh, uh, area, the Havel, lower Havel, and then about the Clear Lakes, and also about the Oder Delta, and what I found around there, uh, some of the images. Uh, some of the benefits of uh, why do we why is it important with this fresh water it is basically fresh water is maybe it's it we should treat fresh water bodies as our life depends on it because it does <laughs> and uh, fresh water are extremely limited resource only three percent of the earth's water is fresh water and only one percent is used uh, we can use for drinking uh, biodiversity is key uh, to stability in nature, and nature is key for human survival. So this is something that the fresh water is is enhancing. Okay, it's for recreational. Spending time in nature makes us feel good. It's a great value. It's a food source. Fresh water provide both us. Of course, but all uh, also all the nature around it with protein. So I think it's important that if you want to eat fish, that you support small local sustainable fishing, and be critical to, to what what kind of fish you you eat and buy where it comes from. Also, uh, you know the freshwater environments they 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 build local pride. They can also build income, like for Peter, a different type of businesses. People come there to spend time. They rent you know, cottages. They rent boats. It's it's a way. It's a different way to make an income when the environment is nice. Lastly, I will uh, give some advice. What can we do? Just some examples. We can support the river, uh, river cleanup. This is what I, in Ina River, when I was there, I joined in for a river cleanup that was arranged by Rewilding Europe. Uh, another thing we can do is to consume organic food because uh, then the pesticides are not used and it, they tend to end up in the river systems. I think one of the most important advice I can tell young people is to go outside and be curious and uh, just leave those screens for a little while and go out and experience real nature. It will make you feel so good and it will be so interesting. Even in your neighborhood, uh, you know, when I go quite often out around where I live and uh, there is all there's the wildlife in your garden. There is uh, there is things to experience wherever you live, uh, even if it's, it's not as wild as going to Serengeti. And last but not least, uh, uh, we protect what we love. And uh, how can we love something if we don't know it exists? And of course, I'm very passionate about the underwater world. I I talk a lot about that, but it's because I experienced a lot with it as well. So I think it's important to, that you, as young people, connect with nature or reconnect with nature. I just want to thank uh, Iris Foundation for supporting those missions and uh, supporting this uh, the adventure of Christoph uh, paddling down. Here is, uh, if anybody wants to get hold of me, this is my Instagram account and uh, my webpage where you can find my email if you want to ask something. Yes. So thank you so much, Magnus. It was a, a really wonderful uh, presentation. So thank you for uh, for sharing the beautiful images and uh, uh, remind us the uh, fragility, but also the, the force of the okay. nature and also the, the beauty of the North European rivers. So and also I want I want to thank you about. Uh, uh, reminding us and each of us uh, that uh, we have a responsibility and uh, a role in our daily choices of consuming, mm -hmm. of uh, uh, moving, and so on. So we thank you for for that. Um, I will continue. Maybe I I try to continue in English so <laughs> you can directly um, listen my questions and yeah. the questions we we got. Um, so. Just to start, um, 
Or how do how did you get uh, this passion for photography and for nature and for photography the nature? Yeah, this is a, I often get that question, and it's quite strange because my my parents uh, uh, were not that kind of people, but my brother and me we were totally into. But I think it was actually the story about it all. I was I, I had a genuine passion for it, uh, watching you know Ch uh, Chucky Cousteau on the television, and you get so super inspired by somebody who's been out there and talking about it. So that's what I try to to also do myself now. But I think it was actually my father bought a, a magazine called Fauna. And we, we started to read that uh, as kids. And we were just like, we just wanted to know more and experience more. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. But in, in France, uh, there are some magazines like that, I think now, uh, nowadays. Uh, so for, for the children, you have, for instance, uh, Salamandre magazine which exists mm -hmm. and it which is uh, really wonderful to to show the to discover many natural things and wonders i think um, also if we go to so if, if if we're talking to an audience that is 10 to 13 years old i mm -hmm. think also not just watching you know Uh, uh, you know, uh, funny, funny films about uh, kittens and dogs, uh, domestic dogs. It's also providing, uh, you know, social media content for them that is fascinating about wildlife. It's also mm -hmm. important. Uh, I think mm -hmm. that's uh, where you you will find some inspiration, and also they will. It's just a starting path, you know. But so I think that for communicators like me, it's important not only to go. What I experienced also with the new, with the new, with the kids. I think social media is an important place. Mm. Uh, yes, and we should use that uh, on a positive way. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, how did you did you learn the photography techniques? How I learned it. Yes. Yeah. Basically, uh, in, in I think it's called autodidact. Yeah, that mm -hmm. you 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 teach yourself. Okay. And yes, basically, the same, same world in I, 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 when I when I started, I was I was passionate about the image, but mm -hmm. I I, uh, I started uh, without knowing anything, mm -hmm. and then as I went along, I I educated myself on the way a little bit, but I had no formal education about photography. But also mm -hmm. because underwater photography was very uh, undeveloped when I started. Uh, it was actually uh, because I didn't know anything. I was much faster than the guys who thought it was like this. Mm -hmm. I was just so nouveau. I, I could do new stuff. So that was also my advantage. And there was actually one thing happening was one day the phone was ringing and uh, I, I took the phone and it was uh, one of Jacques Yves Cousteau's children. Mm -hmm who called me and asked me about advice for underwater photography. And I was just like, okay, this is really strange for me <laughs> because he was my idol, of course. And uh, now mm -hmm. it was the other way around. So yeah, that's what happened one day. It went. <laughs> Thank you. And um, regarding the, 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 the material, uh, the, the, pic the photography uh, material, how heavy is that? Uh, the material you need that when you go uh, under the water? Wait, the, how easy is what? How, how heavy is it? The equipment. What, what, what is the weight of uh, this, uh, all this stuff? Yeah, I, I, was, uh, I was counting on that because the camera is very heavy. Mm -hmm. And also the equipment I use is very heavy. But even if I put on all my diving equipment, let's say like that, and the tube and everything and the camera, I can still not sink. Okay. Because, mm -hmm. because I displace a lot of water. So it's giving me, it's like a boat floating, you know. So mm -hmm. I still have to put, you know, lead. It's, I don't know what it's called in, uh, but lead is a very heavy mm -hmm. material. I think when I walk around, I have extra 60 kilo. Okay. With the camera. <laughs> but mm -hmm. uh, when I'm in the water, I'm uh, neutral. Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. fine. <laughs> Thank you. Um, another question is: um, uh, Do you need a different material when, you, whether you photography in uh, uh, salted water or if you photography in the rivers? And does it depends as well of the temperatures of the water? 
We on, if I, I use different what? Uh, di different uh, materials. Material, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think when, when you're in the ocean, you float mm -hmm. more. You are more buoyant. You, you can, you, so it's more difficult to sink. Uh, but otherwise, it's roughly the same. It's more, uh, uh, so salt water, fresh water, a little bit the same. But the subject, if the subject is this big, like one centimeter, or if it's this big, like a big, it, that's changing a lot. So, but the, the, the problem for me is that when you go down underwater, you choose the lens that you put on already. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so then you have to go back again and again. Uh, so the more the subject and the visibility that's changing in the equipment. Okay. Okay, fine. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure the, the children will be really interested in this kind of uh, uh, information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, during the, your uh, different missions for Europe Aram, um, what, uh, uh, what was the more surprising? Uh, funny and what, what, uh, uh, for what did you get the most, uh, sad? Sad, um, yeah. Yes. So I think that uh, the surprising thing mm -hmm. was the Nutria, uh, when I was spending time with them because I didn't uh, research anything about the Nutria. I, I never seen a Nutria. I didn't know what I was looking at when I find the Nutria. So this is the small beaver-like animal. And mm -hmm. uh, so it was just like I was looking, what is that? And then, mm -hmm. uh, I, then I started to evolve and I found the relation. And uh, so that was all like I call serendipity. It was just happening. Uh, mm -hmm. So unexpected. Uh, and then because... If you're an experienced photographer, you know when you have a good opportunity. So then you you have to all the time be opportunistic. We're just like the animals that we photograph. We have to be opportunistic. So we grab what we get. Uh, and then uh, funny, uh, funny was that, what was funny? It was uh, all the helpful people I met in Germany. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was, I was going up and down stairs. I was heavy equipment and I, and I was alone uh, doing the mission. And they, the people I'd never met before, they just started to help me. They asked me questions. They, they helped me to the car. It was so much uh, energy I, I got back. And the most important, when I come up from a, from a dive, there's always some people standing there. And they, I always get the same <laughs> question. They look at me like this. Uh, Is there something down there? That's what they ask. <laughs> I said, yes, of course. <laughs> and they asked me if I, I'm working for an insurance company, I, I, I'm taking up. But I said, no, there's the nature here. And I showed them pictures. And so that was the most fun is to interact with the, with the people that is there that has you know, the local pride and they love their place, but they don't know what is under there. And then mm -hmm. the most sad, I think it was that seeing uh, this. Uh, 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 over nutrient uh, waters that is very very green and when you look down you can see that it's, it's truly affected even if it was a rewilding area and half of had great problems with that and mm -hmm. i think it's i'm guessing now but i think it has a lot to do with the farming around mm -hmm. uh, 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 but there, of course it's always a combination of things and i know that they've done a lot of work there and i put in a lot of money and, and there's a lot of nice places there but there's still it is a long way to go it just you don't do like that and that is sad to see that uh, uh that even in an area like that it has those problems mm -hmm. yes it will be very interesting to interested sorry um to analyze uh, the water with the scientists yeah um before some uh, places and after some places to to see the, the impact of special uh, areas. Also, maybe it, uh, they know that better than me, but maybe it's also uh, depending on which time you're there. Because mm -hmm. this, uh, I think this is affecting, you know, the summer and late late summer, is, it's more uh, more likely to have the better, uh, the algal bloom, at least. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Okay. And to, to finish with a positive note, <laughs> um, what uh, what did you what give you uh, hope in the missions? What did I? 
um, what, what um, uh, which uh, which things uh, give you hope? The hope is for me that uh, there is something called there is a a, a guidance uh, from the from the EU level about uh, the freshwater uh, environment. It's called the directorate something. It's it's a it's a and then they they have set a very high political ambition for the for the freshwater environments about fish paths, about quality, about. Uh, 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 rewetted areas about uh, wetlands so that's that's a very good start mm -hmm. but uh, what you what you see in reality is that is it, the the level of delivery is very very low <laughs> but mm -hmm. they, so but it's, it's 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 making me positive that there is ambition mm -hmm. but it's just a matter of you know uh, uh Going into farmland, going into very populated areas, and we have to make some sacrifices to to have clean water. And I think it's nothing more important on long term scale. Uh, so, and I also saw that there is uh, uh, the most um, uh, the most uh, positive thing is that nature is not uh, upset even if we've done wrong a long time. Nature will pay back if we give it a chance. So, so, so this is a this is a kind mother. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. so, thanks a lot, Magdus. Really, it was yeah. a, an amazing presentation and amazing pictures as well. Okay, and, uh, very good. Okay, thank you for taking care of me. <laughs> With pleasure. And uh, hopefully we'll meet uh, on the on the Europe RRM uh, way between uh, May and June. Yeah. Okay. I hope so. <laughs> I may, I hope. Hopefully, I will be there at the end uh, of uh, when he's arriving in uh, Paris. Okay, it would yeah. be great. That is my goal. <laughs> okay. Okay. Fine. Uh, thank you to Dominique. She be. I didn't hear yeah. her, but uh, she. I, I'm sure she's been working hard. Yes. Thank you, Dominique. Have a great day. Bye bye. Bye bye.